Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Lankis. Hello all. Hello online. Hello, Hello. line. Hello. <laughs> Let me first thank the, um, uh, the, the School of Library and Information, or sorry, Department of Library and Information, sorry. Yes, yes. Information, Thank you to my Rutgers <laughs> colleagues <laughs> and the Rutgers libraries. I apologize um, once again. Uh, I come from uh, USC, which we were the original USC, um, <laughs> but I understand how that can get mixed up. Uh, I also I I love a chance to get to Rutgers. My father just had the most four most amazing hardworking, incredible months at Rutgers before he went out and sold tombstones in Oklahoma, but that's another story. <laughs> so I enjoy a chance to come to Rutgers and stay just about as long as he did. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, a fellow by the name of Andy Dillon, Andrew Dillon, a uh, retiring dean at the University of Texas, came to Syracuse. And he got up and he gave us a talk like this to the faculty, and he started the talk with, I think the user-based user, for, user perspective is garbage. Now, many of you may not know exactly what kind of statement that's like, but that's a lot like going to the University of South Carolina, getting up and saying, I really think that, that Clem, Clemson and Orange is the best school in the state. Right? It doesn't, it's not something you're supposed to do. We have this ingrained on our system, users, user-based. And he then went on to this discussion where he said, the problem with user-based design, with design systems of this nature is you can kind of game the system. You just keep asking enough people until you find the users that you want to build the system you want to build. And that it's, it's we need a different way of thinking about things. And so that sort of gave me the, the, the courage, I think, to come to places like this and make some interesting statements and seeing how we can we can fly <coughs> out. And I always like to, to start, by the way, um, we were just, some of us, I want to identify who we're remarking isn't it amazing that this is the president right now that we wish we had? Um, <laughs> I can be political, I suppose. Anyway, uh, so I like to start out sort of be giving everyone a Twitter version of the, the, the talk I'm going to give because, you know, you're busy. Um, and so, and I, I'm old school Twitter, only 140 characters here. But when everything is information, nothing is information science. When we view people as users, their only value is consumption. So let's take this on a bit. Because I grew up as an, in the information science domain. I mean, I went and I got my degree, and I was working in computing, and I went to Syracuse, and I got my doctorate, and I had people like Jeff Katzer, and I had all these people telling me about information science and the power of information. My mentor to this day, and my advisor, Mike Eisenberg, this was it, right? It's inf everything's information. Everything's information. And then you throw a few whatever's in, and he'd be shouting. But this idea of information is important. Information underlies everything. We can change the world with information. This is great. And so to come up with a statement like this is practically heresy. So luckily, he's retired, but he'll hear about it. <laughs> uh, but I want to tell you how I got there. Because it started by getting a job, surprisingly. And so a year and a half ago, I moved from Syracuse down to Columbia, South Carolina, and I became a member, uh, I became the director of the School of Library and Information Science. And when I showed up there, I had the game plan. Right? It's a game plan that Eisenberg took to the University of Washington. We've seen it replicated in school after school after school, which is we have a library science program that's great. Now we build an undergraduate program. That undergraduate program shows information. We send them out to industry. We send them out. They get lots of great money and jobs and et cetera. They get $70,000 a year salaries to begin with, and life occurs. And before you know it, there are 500 undergraduates walking around, and they have a great doctoral program. And they've done amazing things at the University of Washington. That's certainly the Syracuse model. I think that's a very much part of the Rutgers model. The original iSchools were a group that came together and said, let's think differently about what is information outside of a library context. How does that work? How can we do it? So I was there. And I was ready to go. And I had the plan. I said, we at Syracuse, at the time I left, had about 175 Masters of Library Science students. When I got to South Carolina, we had 375. But Syracuse had about 800 undergraduates in information science and technology. We had 30. And the idea is, this is not, this is easy. We're going to get 500. We're going to grow. That's resources. That's 
Thatcher, that's more faculty, all good. Let's go do it. I'm just going to take that model and plug it in. And I ran into a problem. So that's lovely Davis Hall, Davis College. Um, and the problem I ran into is not the fact that I am now a fighting Gamecock, take that for whatever you want, <laughs> but at the University of South Carolina, on the Columbia campus, the main campus, it's not quite as easy as let's just be the iSchool. Because what I discovered when I got there is, yes, there is a College of Information and Communications. That's where we are. Once again, very much like the Rutgers model. Right? You guys have communications, you have information, there's journalism going on, there's librarianship, it's an interesting mix. We also have a College of Engineering and Computing. And if you go down one more level, at the, over here in the College of Information and Communications, that's us, Library and Information Science. But over here in Engineering, we have Integrated Information Technology. That grew up out of, and I'm not making this up, the Hospitality and Retail Management Program. In essence, as they were teaching people how to run hotels and restaurants, they began computerizing them, they began needing that technology skills, and that's where the program grew up. And like a day before I got there, they transferred it into the College of Engineering. And the College of Engineering kind of makes sense, particularly when they already have, for example, computer and information systems. Remember MIS and business programs? That's where it is, joint with business and they have computer science, and they have computer engineering. And so as we looked at it, we said, all right, let's put in the plan. We suddenly noticed that all the parts of the plan were in place in other places. And so it forced us to begin to think about something that I frankly didn't have to think about at Syracuse. I never had to think about what is information science when you don't have information science and technology. Right? That and technology was just natural. It just flowed. And yet, I couldn't do that. And so we began doing a lot of things. We began, for example, talking to some of our alumni and what I call our aspirational alumni. Those are the people you wish were your alumni. And we said, well, what is this program? What can our undergraduate be? What is a Bachelor of Science in Information Science? Tell us what it is. And, and we sort of said, well, this is what we think it is. And this is what the curriculum is. And during that, we had this wonderful interaction. And at one point, this great aspirational alumni, Trey, said, oh, I know what you're doing. You're trying to prepare geeks with social skills. Now, I have, in case you want them, we have, we have stickers, so feel free. Um, and it was like, we, this was a moment for the faculty who were involved that was revelatory. Because not only was it a really cute little thing, and by the way, if you search online, you'll find lots of geeks with social skills. We don't pretend that we came up with this. But it was like, we literally looked at each other and said, I now know what to tell the doctor when they say, oh, you're a professor. What are you a professor of? And we say, information science. And they go, oh, OK. And, or you say, library science. They're like, oh, I love books, right? Whatever it is. But we, we suddenly had a moment where we could say, we do information science. Oh, what is that? I teach geeks with social skills. Literally, I told that to my doctor. He's like, oh, that's cool. Right? And then I could tell my dentist, oh, that's cool. I could tell my mother, oh, that's great. Right? Suddenly, it gave us a reality to it. We were so thrilled. In fact, we were so thrilled, we had planned 18-foot-high banners of this going on those massive columns in front of our beautiful 100-year-old building. By the way, I have to say this because I'm from South Carolina. Davis Hall was named after Means Davis, who was a professor of history, and it was built after the Civil War. So anyway, that... <laughs> So I was ready. I mean, I was ready. I, I had put the purchase order in ready. And I got this call from the provost who said, you know, could you run this by the engineers real quick? And I said, sure. So I ran it by the engineers. And the, 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 the sort of first blush was, hey, we're not in charge of your marketing. Feel free. Then I got an email from the dean of engineering who said something to the effect of, if you put those banners up, I'm ready to go to the provost, and we'll have a discussion about exactly what we should be putting up and talking about these things. And I thought this was an odd reaction. And then I realized there are such a thing as geeks without social skills. And, <laughs> and the worst thing happened is he made a good point. I hate when that happens. I was ready for a fight. I was going to go to the provost. Here I am three days. <laughs> and he said, the problem is, that in many places, particularly in high technology engineering firms, it's not the geeks that sort of, oh, those are nerds and whatever. 
It's that it's a label that allows people to de-identify their students. Throw some geeks at it. They need to have a problem, put more geeks. And that turns into, we can outsource these geeks over to this section. We can move these geeks around. It takes them out of the idea of being leaders, promoting, and pushing, which is, by the way, exactly what we mean when we say geeks in library and information science. He was saying, in their field, it dehumanizes them and devalues them. And he said, frankly, the campus of a university with 18-foot high banners is not a place for subtle. And so it's like, all right, so we have stickers. We use this. It's a great way of recruiting. But we're not going to rub it in our engineering friend's face. I get it. <coughs> so then we began, this began actually a good discussion because it was, well, let's talk about what we mean by geeks and what we're doing. And you're computing. You've got these things. And so we came up with this which is we needed to explain to 18-year-olds, really 16 and 17-year-olds and their parents, why would you send them here and get a degree in this? Right? That's, for undergraduates, that's not the only type of students, but that's a predominant demographic of folks who go to the University of South Carolina. And so we had to come up with, what is this? Particularly, once again, because it wasn't as simple as saying, we're information technology. You know all those things where computers and beep beep, lights and light, right? We're that. We weren't that. We couldn't be that. That was somewhere else. We were information science. And so we began thinking about, what does that look like? And so this is what we came up with. We said, all right, you know that iPhone you've got in your pocket? If you want to build it, and you want to build a new one, and try not to put the notch at the top, you want to go to computer engineering. That's the place to do it. They do chips. They're great. Love them. You want to make them work. You want to build the software with algorithms and take calculus, go over to Computer science. They do programming. They worry about algorithms. They worry about optimization. They worry about parallelization. They worry about all of these different things. You want their go. And this was good for us because, once again, my experience at Syracuse, I don't know about at Rutgers, was we would get a lot of sophomores and juniors who would wander in sort of with this haggard look like, I like technology in high school, so I thought it was computer science. And then I got there, and I don't feel like a human being anymore, right? It's kind of like, I don't want to speak binary. That wasn't what I loved about technology, right? I loved gaming, and I loved apps, and I loved what I could do with it. But when I went to computer science, because it was a computer, that must be computer science, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wasn't into that level of code and decoding and of such. Once again, great for folks who are, but for our folks who weren't, it didn't fit. So we say, great, if you were into that, if you want the computing world, go. And if you want to install them, implement them, maintain them, you, you really love the wires, you really love worrying about the networking side, great. They got a program over in engineering called information technology, go. And then this is, of course, where you always claim the high ground. Always claim the high ground. Which is, but if you want to make people life better because of it, if you want to push an organization forward, if you want to make an impact in society and have a social mission, that's us. That's where we are. And we like this. We're like, oh, now we got the stickers. Now we got a pretty graph. Oh, happy, happy. And back, we got we got all three of these departments to look at this and go, yeah, that, that actually works for us. We're, that's the kind of people we want. We don't want, I mean, they're in a situation where they get people who said, I love gaming and like, what computer experience? Well, it was definitely Halo 3 and 4 and 5. And they get in there and they would fail out and it would hurt their statistics, it would hurt morale, it just didn't work. But they were thrilled that there was a place for folks to go, that they had that. So this worked out really well. But then we realized the next step, which is what we've just explained of who we are is by who we aren't. In essence, what we've said is what we don't do. And so by default, that's what we do. But we needed to go to the next level and say, but what do you do? And that's where we came up with this. And I'll go through this quickly, because stick with me for a minute. Information scientists, that's what we prepare, help organizations make better, more informed decisions. Right? Information scientists goes through a process to a more informed decision. We analyze situations, we analyze data, data analytics, we look at the culture, we look at technology options. We implement those through systems and policies and technologies, because systems, as we know, more than just technology systems. We manage, we implement that, we implement it, we have impact, we build processes, we prepare people. And ultimately, we do that in an ethical and social framework. 
we liked this because it finally gave us something that we could begin laying things like learning objectives on. We could begin laying curriculum out of. For example, we required calculus. Let me go with this again. We required calculus. <laughs> And the discussion I had in the curriculum committee went a lot like this, which is my faculty would look at me and I would say, would the number of people who know calculus please raise your hand? Why are we requiring calculus? And the idea was, well, because it was hard and analytical. I said, yeah, but statistics is hard and analytical and useful, right? And we began looking at curriculum. We began looking at different ways of doing it. When you do data, we were just having a conversation beforehand about use of R and looking at some of the statistical analysis programs. When you look at a lot of data science, data mining, analytics, this is important analytical skills. Right? Calculus is what you use when you optimize systems and build algorithms, which absolutely happens, but not so much in our school. So we began looking at this. So my case study, and this is, by the way, a year and a half of in-depth, I don't know, let's try this, type of research, is I, we, so I came to this conclusion, and I think many of us did, which is that information is not enough. It's not enough to say, I do information. Because information, I, I like to say, it's, it's like a conversational lubricant. It's a word that we use that sort of gets us by, but doesn't necessarily stick anywhere, right? That idea of, so, do you have the information? I did. Can I provide that information? I stored the information. I'll print the information for you. What is that again? I don't know, right? It, it's, it's like the famous Zinn study where he, he, he she, I'm not sure, Zinn asked, 50 information scientists for a definition of information came out with 104 answers. <laughs> I did that with my own faculty. I asked five faculty, got seven answers. My favorite was, I don't know, I don't care, get out of my office. <laughs> and, and so this idea that it's, it's all about information, it's, that we're living in information, hey, information, it's all about information. Until we could get down to a definition of it, it wasn't useful. When it was information and technology, because we had a physical metaphor, a physical analog, we could point to it. Say, we're that. We're that. But when we didn't have that, it didn't work. The other thing is, information technology can simply be technology if you don't have a social dimension to it. Once again, that what they were teaching in the iTech classes, not bad stuff, but they were teaching how to maintain a machine, how to hook up a machine, how to organize and run machines. Right? Well, that's technology, but they weren't worried about were the machines spying on people in their rooms? Were the machines, right? What is the social privacy aspect of that? How do we understand the data integrity of that? How, right? There's all this stuff that isn't technology. And so the other part which helped us, which is, here's an information technology department. Great. What's not information technology? Of course we're going to teach technology in our curriculum. It's like saying, you know, we're going to teach math. No one owns math. No one owns physics. No one owns technology. And the other thing that we found out was that, once again, information is not enough because what's happened is this, and I know that I have many uh, I have area specialist librarians, is the area specialists have, in essence, owned information. They agree. If you sit there and say, journalism is information, they'll look at you and say, yeah, absolutely. That's why I had a class on journalism and information, and technology and journalism, and how to use the internet to do journalism. We, we went discipline by discipline by discipline. They weren't teaching Taylor, and they weren't teaching you know, Patrick Wilson, and they weren't teaching you know, information retrieval, and they weren't teaching Todd, and they weren't teaching Radford. They were rediscovering it, but they were teaching information. They'd already adopted it. Right? How are you a sociologist or an archaeologist without knowing technology? So there wasn't anything unique left in information. They'd all sort of given it their own spin. So what is it? We need a different frame to move things forward. So what we came out with the BSIS program is this idea of, yes, it's analytics, but the social dimension. It isn't, a, it, it, the, um, it isn't enough to know technology you have to understand that it exists in a political and ethical context. Social science is important. We're going to talk about in a minute data science and how it fits. And I think that what we've now found is that's true for LIS as well, which is not just information science, information systems, but also for libraries and where libraries are both. Because I don't buy the idea that libraries have evolved into information organizations and therefore we're done. So let's go through this a little bit. I will argue that the information narrative that we have used, particularly in libraries, has run its course. 
that we've succeeded, that Eisenberg has gone out and can sit happy in retirement, that people agree with him. That when he showed up and said, every industry is an information industry, now all the industries are going, yep, and? That took work, that took work. Many people I'm looking around have lived a life where we've had to fight that fight. And it's work. But the problem is we've won. And now it's been adopted and assimilated in those industries. And while we have something to say about them, we're now back to the sort of librarian generalist problem, which is it's great that you have a general view of this, but I need a specific answer. <coughs> so where do we go from there? I would argue that libraries as institutions, librarianship, has gone through a sort of these macro narratives, what I'm going to eventually refer to here as a school of thought. We've thought about libraries differently. Right? It used to be the, the humanities lab, that academic libraries, I and mean, I know I'm going back 13, I'm, I'm just going to take 2,000 years of history and compress it, stick with me for a second. <laughs> right? That idea that that's where the, the, the history professor had their lab and they had a lot of books to do it, that became the library. That, the theologian had a bunch of their theological library, et cetera, and it was an area for the humanities. We then see that, for example, with the social movements in Scandinavia and the social movements, particularly in the United States, we recast libraries, particularly public libraries, as a university of the people. That is, it was a place for learning. Melville Dewey famously said that a, a public library and a public school are co-equal educational institutions. The kids that we took out of the factories go into schools, and the Adults and we left in the factories go into libraries, right? That's what Carnegie. Carnegie was, let me get the money back before they come and take it, right? And philanthropy is important, and I'm going to build libraries, and I'm going to build educational institutions, and I'm going to build higher education because people who govern themselves must be knowledgeable. So libraries really became this concept of a university of the people. And when we look at the switch from the 1800s to the 1900s, we see Cutter and Dewey and a lot of folks sweat sitting down saying, now we live in an industrial age and we must standardize. And libraries became about efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. The Dewey Decimal System wasn't just because Dewey had a great idea, it was if we all use it, we can all reduce the amount of time and task and therefore we can scale up. If you read a lot of the language around the creation of the American Library Association, public libraries and academic libraries, it was efficiency and standardization to fit an industrial model. We saw what happened in education. We're dealing with the fact of what dealt with education. It led to the idea of copy cataloging and, frankly, the decimation of cataloging librarians ever was efficiency, etc. And it's a narrative we still get to this day. If you go to a library conference and you're able to get out without hearing the term best practice, <laughs> you win an award, right? That idea that we have to, so your old joke, right? I used to say that IT people never say no. They just throw three letter acronyms at you until you leave. But we like to put up a blog. Oh, blog, sure. Well, that's going to require a PHP implementation, which we're going to have to get a socket to go through the SQL system. Right? And so the minute you, your head, you don't realize what they just said was, go away. <laughs> I think libraries have the equivalent, which is there's no such thing as a bad idea. It's just a bad idea in our library. Right? That would be great in a public library. That would be fantastic in an academic library. But this idea of, of the standardized book palace, I mean, realize even the notion of libraries as book palaces really is an invention of the last hundred years when the reduction in ink and paper production allowed publishers to drastically increase their catalogs and libraries kept their old collection strategies and soon we ran out of room. But that idea of standardized, standardized, standardized. I would argue that it then slipped in the 80s and the 90s, big time, and today, to an information narrative. We are an information organization. We provide information. We inform students. We inform faculty. We deal with information on a regular basis. We have databases. It's digital. It's information. It's us. We prepare information literacy. Right? We prepare our students in, in high school and grade school, in college, out there to be information literate, to understand information and manipulate information. Not smart or not knowledgeable, but information literate. Right? I would argue that that is, going, that is more limiting to the future of libraries right now than even the book palaces, because that's the problem. Yes, our communities look at libraries as book places, but our librarians look at them as information places. 
And what information has done, as I'm going to sort of walk through, is it has removed the human empathy and responsibility in the, in the relationships that we have. Think about for a moment, what do we call them? What do we call the people who use our services? Users? How many people have users? How many people like being used? <laughs> Think about that term for a minute. Because what user means is it literally defines a person in relationship to a system in a transaction. Right? I don't go home, you don't go home at night and go, boy, this user is really tired. You don't do that. You don't sit there and think, I'm a user of the public education system. You don't think of, well, this is my female user, and I'm the male user in this relationship. Right? It's not, that's not what well, if you do, family therapy. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what we begin to do, is we begin to reduce it down to the idea of a processor, a feed, and an output. Think about for a moment, I'm going to give you the most apple pie public librarian thing idea in the world. Summer reading. Right? Why do we do summer reading? We want to instill the love of reading. How do we do it? We bring them in, we run them through a system, i.e. giving them books and rewards and materials. They process it, i.e. read it and respond to it. And therefore, the output should be love of reading. Frankly, it turns into love of the gift. But that's another issue. That's, we look at education. When we talk about students as clients, it's the same concept. That is that we had a transactional relationship. But I saw as you folks came in talking about folks online, you know, Marie sitting there going, that's my student, greeting them, knowing them, how's it going, what's happening. There's a relationship there. What a lot of people don't understand when they're students, my son's looking for a college right now. When he graduates in four years with a college degree, right, he is almost completely dependent upon the reputation of that university for his first job. In 10 years, that university is almost completely dependent on his reputation as an alumni. That's not a client relationship. That's not a transactional relationship. That's a deeper kind of relationship. But user, information, computer, we keep phrasing people as this idea of someone who uses something, processes it, and fits out. I had a fabulous conversation with the Radfords both of them at one at an ACES, where we talked about the idea of we all adopt sort of metaphors that are going on in times, right? Your brain is like a computer, I believe was the one Gary told me, right? Well, it's got memory and it's got processing and storage. He goes, your brain is a bunch of cells and mush. It's only like a computer in the sense that we are applying a metaphor to it. And we see all the places it doesn't work. Well, what we've done is we've taken this idea of information, information use, computing use, and we've applied it to librarianship, and it's been very effective. We applied to LIS education, it's been very effective. But we're starting to see where it begins to, to slip. And I'll give you a couple examples. No, actually, I have a couple of examples. Data science and analytics. This is a big thing. If you want, you're an information school, you do data science, data science is cool, it's all about data science, gotta do data science, let's do some more data science. If you want a great, quick read, Weapons of Math Destruction, I highly recommend it, <laughs> from a former data scientist who sits there and talks about how algorithms are really just encoded opinions that allow people to say it's objective. But it's not. We code them. We code them based on our assumptions, based on the surrogates that we use based on that data. If we look at data science literally as data processing, we lose. One, because it's not unique. What field? Does an inform isn't information? What field isn't data? <coughs> what field isn't data, right? The business school, well, we do analytics. That's all about us. Or retailing, we do analytics. Or who doesn't do analytics? It's called quantitative methodology. We do data. But what about the social and ethical aspect? What about not only the data management, we were just having a great discussion about data integrity, but the impact of that, the social impact, the ethical frame that we think about that in, the people in that. Don't we have to think about, if we implement this kind of algorithm, who wins and who loses? Who do we enable and who do we disadvantage? Right? We see this in journalism and communications as well. That idea that they're all information now. So where do we go from here? I would argue we need a new school of thought. So I talk about the knowledge school. 
it's not a school as in an academic unit. It is a school of thought. So this is not to compete with the I schools. I've gotten so many emails about this, about Dave, we're working really hard on like the posters and the t-shirts for I schools, don't screw it up. Or my dean loved because he was a J school, so he said, well, I got an I school, an L school, a J school, and a K school. I own the middle of the alphabet. <laughs> this is not about branding. We are an I school. We're the world's newest I school. We're very happy. We like our, our colleagues, including Rutgers and the I school. We want to contribute and be part of it. We want to get our undergraduates to know what iSchool is. That's not what this is about. This is about what we think about. And so a school of thought, and I, this is a picture of Chicago, and the reason I bring up the picture of Chicago is, if you, has anyone ever heard of the Chicago School? Yeah. In economics, there's one in social science, but the one I want to talk about is architecture. So Chicago is a lovely city that turns out was built out of wood and burned quickly. And after Chicago went through a massive fire, lost massive infrastructure, something very interesting happened. First of all, a Chicago community and identity came back and said, we're going to rebuild it. So there was this mass of people committed to rebuilding. The other thing that happened was that steel production became cheap and efficient. And it was fire resistant. Another thing that happened, a fellow by the name of Otis invented a safety elevator that could now be driven by an electric motor, and so suddenly we could have elevators that our buildings could be taller because we didn't have to use the stairs. And the other ingredient that happened was a bunch of really interesting, slightly wacky architects moved into Chicago. Some of them at the University of Chicago, some of them at architectural firms, and they got together and they said, why are we doing this the same way that we've always done this? Let's think differently about this. And they began, this isn't the first building, but this is an example of Chicago School of Architecture, and eventually turned into modernism, which is the other buildings, and they began thinking about what could we do with the new technology? What could we do with the new capabilities? What ideas? They were sitting talking with engineers. They were sitting talking with urban planners. They were sitting talking to hydrologists. They were sitting talking to business people, and they began to build beautiful buildings that were tall, because they could do it. And they could build them taller and taller. And eventually, they realized that they didn't need to decorate them because they're so high up in the air, they can't even see the stuff at the top. So they began dropping off pieces that led to modernism. Now, this school of thought that began in Chicago as a solution to how do we rebuild a city dramatically changed the world as we know it. Because not only did it create higher and taller buildings, which had meant that suddenly businesses could grow larger because they could consolidate a workforce ever larger together. Add to this one other thing, telephony. Now we have the advance of the telephone. And so now you didn't have to travel all the way up, down, or around the country. You could call. And they began to centralize locations. They began to centralize them in industrial cities, which led to urbanization. We're talking about something like 300,000 people every two months are moving from rural locations in this, country, in this world to urban locations. We are seeing a, a pouring out as, as Farms industrialize, so they no longer need as much labor. They're going into the rural urban centers where businesses and economies are thriving. That's because people got together and said, let's think differently about how we build buildings. That wasn't the only factor, but it was a big factor. So my question to you is, if we step out of this information frame for a moment about what's next for libraries, because the, I'll tell you the answer. If the information frame, the next thing for libraries is data science. I was on an IMLS review panel. I can't tell you the number of review panels that was all about teaching librarians to do data science, because that's going to be the next one, because repositories didn't quite work out the way we thought. And virtual reference, I take the blame, did not work out the way we thought. And before that, it was, but that's the next thing, because it's information. We need more information. Let's get the information. Stop. What's the next thing? Because I don't think it's data science, but it's not being the computing people. The foundation of this school of thought is around knowledge and meaning, not data and information. So let me get my terms clear. Knowledge is uniquely human. This is knowledge. The books, the materials, the things on the shelves, not knowledge. Results of knowledge, outputs of knowledge, but not knowledge itself. If it was knowledge itself, we could just bring every, you know, five-year-old in, let them lose for 24 hours in the library, they'd rub up against knowledge in all sorts of ways we don't think about, and they come out being able to read. That's not how it works, right? They need skills, they need to understand it, they need to build it, they need to create a conceptual understanding of it, they need pre-literacy activities, 
They need to link it to other nodes. They need something uniquely human. And so knowledge is uniquely human. It's constructed. That is, what, how I know something and how you know something, we probably came to it in a different way, and we probably even understand it in a different way. And it's rational, not transactional. It's, sorry, it's relational, not transactional. You don't go and pick up knowledge. We were talking about this is what I was arguing with David about at Harvard. You don't just pick up knowledge and say, ah, I've got it. Now it's in there. David Weinberger, we, we had a bit of a disagreement because he tells the story about at Harvard, they were having this discussion about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and he was looking around and he noticed that people were familiar suddenly typing, they were bringing up Wikipedia, they read really quickly, and then they got engaged in the conversation. And his conclusion was, information is a commodity. You can, in essence, go and get it as a commodity. It's a transaction. And I said, that's great. You were at Harvard, you said, with Harvard-educated students that had great bandwidth, and they were in a law program, and they knew how to read, and they had ready access to this. I said, this is the latest bit they added to their world, but it came from a massive undertaking to understand. Right? So it's not transactional. Patrons, people, I, I'm not thrilled with patrons, but at least it had this idea of at least some co-ownership in the process. Some invest users, drug dealers, and computer scientists. <laughs> so the foundation must be knowledge and meaning. When we talk about data science, I'm not against data science. This is not data science is crap. This is Data science that understands its impact, understands people's lives, understands the social context, understands how it works. Understands that when you walk into a K-12 school and you say, we're going to use data to improve teachers, you don't just collect whatever data is at hand, run it through an algorithm and say, goodbye, you're fired because you, you were at the bottom of this algorithm. Well, why was I at the bottom of this algorithm? Well, you, you didn't have a great enough improvement in your classes. Well, I taught honors program. Do you know how much improvement I do with honor students? Like that. Last year, I taught the, the most remedial classes. This year, I, and they go like that, because I'm a good teacher. Well, but the algorithm says, the algorithm's an opinion. It's wrong. Where's the human aspect? Where's understanding the impact? Where's understanding the social culture, social impact? It's community-based and aspirational. That is, our ultimate success is in the success of others. That's really weird. But this is an ethic that we embed in all our library science students, and all our librarians, and all our professors. That is, it's not what great system I built, what great room, what great display, what great organization. It's did that person learn and do better in school? Is it that person do a better job? Did that person, is that person more effective? And it's aspirational because it's based on the success of others, not on the remediation of others. Information, if you look at, once again, an information frame, how much of the information frame is about deficits? You don't have the right information. You need better access to information. Clearly, you didn't get the information. You're not information literate. That's very different than saying, what can I do that's going to help you move forward? Uh, Betsy Kennedy at Casanova Public Library had a program where she realized that a lot of kids were coming to food pantries. And she said, if we're going to do literacy with kids, we should go do them in the food pantry as opposed to seeing if they're going to come to the library. And she did. And when she was there, she realized that the parents also needed help because a lot of the reason why they were there is they didn't have sufficient access to education. So they started education programs, DED programs, things like that. And she gave out, once again, as typical librarian as you can get, she gave out a free book to every one of the students who went through the literacy program. And she gave one of the books to this eight-year-old girl who started crying. She said, what's wrong? And the eight-year-old girl said, this is the first new thing I've ever owned. What she gave her was not a new book, and not a literacy instrument, and not something to be used. She gave her work. She gave her values. She gave her recognition. And what took Betsy Kennedy into the food pantry wasn't because kids couldn't read and people didn't have food. It was, if kids could read and people had food, imagine what this community would be like. It wasn't an information deficit. It's a compassion deficit in some way. So aspirational. And this is the biggie, proactive. We seek to improve society. We have a societal mission. I 
this this I know it sounds like a no duh thing, but when I began talking about this back in 2010, I had many academic librarians who looked at me and said, that my job, my, not my job. I said, your job is to help people learn. Said, no, not my job. I said, yes, why are you here? My job is to get the professor what they need. Their job is so they learn. I said, hmm. So you have no responsibility then? No. So the value to this campus is preparing students, and you're arguing that you don't have direct value to the students. I said, this is a problem. But it's easier that way, right? It's easier if we say, we provide the information. Look at, once again, these, the efficiency model. When we look at reference and modeling, and I, once again, I'm a huge fanboy of Marie Radford and information encountering the social context of information because it's not a transactional understanding of this. I've learned a lot from that. Because, once again, it's not, I give you the information, good luck. Did it help? Did it make a difference? Did it change a life? Why are we bringing dogs in during finals time? Well, one, to terrify the students who don't like dogs. <laughs> right? Because we understand that a kid, sorry, and a student at that point in their life could well break. And they're not going to break because chemistry was too hard. They're going to break because they don't think they can do enough to understand chemistry. And that's not just about the book, it's also about understanding themselves and their value and their worth and their time, and I'll listen to you, and I'll be here, and it's important. Now, I know this sounds really warm and fuzzy, but that's what people are. We're warm, and some of us are fuzzier than others, but being proactive and saying, sometimes that happens in a building, sometimes that happens in a food pantry, sometimes that, right? We have a literacy initiative. Oh, I think I get to that. Some examples. Natural disaster. When Hurricane which was the one that came up to New York and had a good time? Sandy. Sandy. The libraries were open to allow people to recharge and power because their connection to their family was that device. Even when librarians didn't, their own homes were destroyed or flooded, they opened the libraries. We're there for you when you need help. In South Carolina, when we had our thousand year long flood, FEMA set up in public libraries, not just because they were convenient for right places, but because they were community trusted hubs People came in and could meet. They took bookmobiles, they stripped out the books, they put water on them, and they drove them around. They began to understand what it took to do that. In, in, there's one story that as they went out to rescue people, there was a man in a wheelchair. And it was an important wheelchair. It basically also was a respirator. It was terrible. And as the water rose, it rose around his house. And his house was on a slight hill, but it eventually circled the house. Now, this is a South Carolina thing. Because when I was in Syracuse, I'd say, great, just wait for it to freeze. You'd go right over. <laughs> but in South Carolina, it's not just water that comes around your house. It's water moccasins that come around your house. Yeah, they're poisonous crap. I'm telling you. I saw an ant. It was beautiful. They said, oh, no, we call those cow killers. I'm like, great. <laughs> the rescue boat shows up. It's a big pontoon boat, whatever. They can't get the guy in the boat. And the guy can't go without the chair. They had to drive off and hope, and by the way, the water stopped. Now you sit there and you go, that's not my problem. You know what? That's your community. What can you do? How can you identify it? How can you fix it next time? How can we as information scientists do things like understand universal design and apply it to rescues as well as interfaces and sidewalks? How can we look at data? So we have data scientists on faculty, Amir Karami, who looked at Twitter feeds. And he was pulling Twitter feeds in real time to identify where first responders needed to go. Data science, yes, with an impact, with a social mission, with a reason to be there. When we look at something like literacy, cocky. This is, we're the Gamecocks. That's cocky. <laughs> South Carolina, the motto of the education department is, thank God for Mississippi. All right? <laughs> we have something that's literally called the corridor of shame. It was a documentary that there are places that if they brought broadband out into these places, they couldn't install the machines because the machines would be waterlogged with the rain because of the hole in the roof. That they brought them in, and so there are literacy areas that are just frightening. When Boeing relocated high-tech manufacturing in the Charleston area, they went to hire high school folks because they only need a high school degree to take, get their manufacturing jobs. 
they found out they didn't they couldn't deal with high-tech manufacturing so they said no problem STEM we'll throw STEM at them and they found they couldn't read in high school and so they began third grade reading programs and cocky is we take cocky now once again football is different in the south college football is I mean you what pro team I don't know what high you know, what high school team do you root for I mean really this is it's scary so there are three-year-olds that know cocky when cocky shows up people are happy so ten years ago a bunch of students and now what we do as part of our school we throw cocky on a bus with the undergraduates from all the different disciplines and athletes we drive them to the lowest schools we get them out and they have to promise cocky that they will read one hour a night. And the athletes get up and read story time and say, you love football and you want to play football for USC? You've got to read it. And the business majors are there, and the advertising majors, and the social work majors are all together. Proactive. You don't wait for the library to say, did you read today? You put on a kick-ass bird suit, drive out to it. <laughs> In education, Topeka, Shawnee County, they wanted every student ready for kindergarten. And when they looked around and said, every student's going to be ready for kindergarten, what they found was there was one particular area of town where that was not happening. Shawnee, uh, Topeka County is unique. It doesn't have branches. It has one library in the middle. So they worked with United, Found United Way, and they said, we're going to get prepared. It's going to be ready. And they said, the problem is in this one area. Guess what? It tends to be minority. It tends to be poor. And they found out the main issue wasn't did they have the programs for them. They couldn't get to them. So they worked with buses. And they said busing and created bus lines to bring them in and out. And when they couldn't get there, they sent the librarians out to do it. And when there weren't enough librarians, they, they took volunteers from the community, gave them literacy training, and sent them into the streets to do it. They were just written up in Library Journal of the Year, I think, this year, for doing this. <coughs> they have as part of their strategic plan, literacy, at the Richland Library just won the IMLS Award, right in, in Columbia. Their strategic plan that says, we will manage things well. We'll do great. But there's a whole section of that strategic plan that says we will fight poverty. We will have a diverse working economy. We will facilitate understanding among a diverse community. They have what they call courageous conversations. They have 60 and 70 people showing up in the library to discuss race, discuss voting rights, discuss immigration, black white, old, young, Latino, they're all there. A library is doing that. Library is not neutral. They say, this is what our community needs to know. Right? Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, in, in Philadelphia Free Library, homeless population, huge homeless popula population coming into their main library. They sent out a sort of SOS several years ago. How do we deal with the homeless problem in our library? You know what the answers they got from many libraries? Here's how to enforce vagrancy laws. This is how to put pigeon strips on any flat surface to prevent them from lying down, etc. The librarians said, the problem isn't with the homeless. The problem is homelessness. And while we're not going to be able to solve it, by God, we're not going to ignore it. So they built a cafe. You're going, huh? They built a cafe. The cafe was funded by a major bank. The coffee, equipment, and barista training came from Starbucks. All the food came from local bakeries, so they weren't in competition, and the staffing was done from a homelessness to work organization, so they had jobs and, and they could show and build and create this. They invited civil services, they invited all these folks into the library. Is there homelessness in Philadelphia? Yes. Did the library ignore it? No. And I can show academic examples, we can talk about special library examples, but these are just some of them that says, the mission, our mission, what we're here to do is to improve blah, 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 blah. Put more simply, our job as librarians, our job as information scientists, our job as a knowledge school, <coughs> a knowledge school at Rutgers, a knowledge school at South Carolina, a knowledge school at the Richland Public Library, a knowledge school at the Rutgers Library, a knowledge school at the Philadelphia School Libraries, a knowledge school that involves internationally what is the next step? It is not data science as the next bit and virtual reality and augmented reality. It's creating a world that our communities deserve. We started with a throw-off joke about George Bush. Is this the world we want to live in? I, sorry to throw a heavy one at the end of this, but for a moment. Is this a world that we want in Charlottesville? 
Is this a world that we want in Las Vegas? Is this a world that we want in the corridor of shame? I don't think it is. And I don't want to blame any one particular person, though I do often. But you know who's really to blame are the people who said, this is not the world I want to live in, and then don't do anything about it. And it's, how do we get out there? How do we serve these people? How do we support these people? Rutgers is a state university. We were just having, Dee and I were having a brief conversation. The love of the fact that it's not just the undergraduate. She's dealing with physicists and Nobel Prize winners and someone off the street. And they all are coming here as a place to learn and get better. I mean, that's the thing. They're not coming to our libraries to be informed. They're coming to our libraries to have a better life. That better life might be 15 minutes because they found the right book. That better life might be a more convenient internet connection that they have on. I give you that. But what could it be? That better life can be a new education, a new possibility, getting out of poverty. That it, better life can be a new understanding of the world. That better life can be sitting down with someone you thought were your enemy and suddenly you realize they're human beings. That better life can be more understanding, diversity, and richness. Do we provide resources? Absolutely. Do we provide information? Sure. But we don't provide information at the end. Those books, this building, that room, this projector, there are tools to do what we really want to do, which is to improve your life. That's what the knowledge school is. So what I learned out of trying to figure out what is information without technology, what is information when it's been absorbed, it's not information. It's knowledge. And you say, but that's education. Fine. What is it? When I sit down and use a computer, I am not using a computer. I'm changing how I view the world. Once again, can be minor. Boy, that's stupid. Right? <laughs> Boy, I won't tweet that again. But it can be massive. I had no idea. This is amazing. Right? I'm not using, I am using the computer. But it's, that's not, I don't care. I could be using a book. I could be using a person. I'm expanding my world. So our focus can't be on what we use, because it's going to change. Our focus can't be on the latest bit of technology, because that's going to change. Our focus can't be just everything is information, because yeah, everything is information. Our focus is on better lives, through knowledge, through learning, through a perspective of the world, through expanding horizons and capabilities. And that sounds mushy. But if you look at Marie's work on information encountering, there's real science, there's real methods, there's real thoughts about how to have when you look at how did these people build those programs, it wasn't just, oh, we feel really bad about illiteracy. It's like, shut up and do something. So what's out of an high school? You know what I want to be? I want to be an high school that changes the world. I'm a librarian. You know what I want you to be? I want you to be a librarian who changes the world. Maybe that's one person. Maybe that's 10 people. But that's what we have to be about. And if we constantly push back and say it's information, that puts the focus on the stuff, the external, the tools. You are the value of the library. You are the value of the library. I don't know if we're still streaming, but you are the value of the library. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> That's what's up front. When someone comes and says, we are going to data mine the hell out of your people, you're going to stand up and say, can I have a discussion with you about privacy? When someone comes in and says, you are neutral and you must do this, you go, I'm not neutral. I'm rational. I'm intellectually honest, but I'm not neutral. I see a better tomorrow, and I'm going to work like hell to find it. And I'm going to work with you so that we agree on it, but when we don't agree on it, at least I'm going to open a channel so I respect our disagreement. That's very different than information. Because information is too easy. It's too easy. It's too easy to say there's a literacy over there. Throw information at it. Because you can. That's what we see with, with broadband. If only those poor people in the outback of Australia, if only those poor people in rural, there is no rural New Jersey, is there? But anyway, yes, <laughs> in rural New Jersey. If only those poor people had internet access, life would be better. Is it better yet? Oh, they can't use it. Oh, it's too expensive. Oh, they haven't been trained. Oh, they get online and they are harassed and bullied. Oh, that's our job. Right? And the tools that we use are going to change every day. So, we make librarians. We make information specialists, numbers, crunchers, business leaders, community <coughs> educators, 
We send them to libraries and schools and Fortune 500s, think tanks, startups. We put information into action. We change the world we are moving. We're the knowledge school. Consider this your invitation to join this school of thought from wherever you are and enrich it and enhance it. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, thoughts, improvements. Dr. Radford. <laughs> so um, I hear what you say about users. I've never really been very comfortable with that term myself. But the, life, the American Library Association, way back when, they decided that readers, you know, so early in library history, yep. were called readers. Yep. But they rejected that because if you came in and had a meeting in the library, or you came in in a community group, Girl Scouts or whatever, um, that it wasn't, it wasn't embraced. Right. You know, reading it wasn't a specific inclusive. activity. Yes. And then patron was because uh, earlier, you know, Ben Franklin and all that before the free public library of Philadelphia, right. you had to pay as a patron, you know. Uh, right. So, what do you suggest is the term other than user? I like people, but um, actually, this is this is per let me walk well, that. People through. is also very general. I, I know it is. So here's 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 the five minute version of this. Uh, it starts with um, Joan Fry Williams in a in a consulting moment where they were trying to write a strategic plan and they came to what do we call them. She said, hold on a sec. She literally walked out and started asking people, what do I call you, what do I call you? In a public library, they said, I'm a member. I got a card, I pay taxes, I'm a member. I like member. Member, it has a sense of exclusion, but it also has a sense of inclusion and ownership, which I like a lot. Community member, once again, I use the word community very broadly. A university is a community, a law firm is a community, a hospital is a community. It, a community is somewhere where you have a common variable that you all are aware of, and you have a system for distributing scarce resources, whether that's real estate, money, time, effort, attention. So I like member in general. But the term that we within the profession, within the discipline amongst ourselves use, that's where I want us to take user and think hard about that. <coughs> the term that we use with our community, for example, my guess is you might use the word student, or faculty, or staff. Or customer. Or customer. I know. Just don't use consumer, because then I'll do the same trick with being used. Um, right? But but that point, actually, I have many that use customer. What you use with your community, I have one one library that uses neighbor. I like that one a lot. I have one library that uses, I have a lot of libraries that use customer. I have some that use user. That's a negotiation with, with your community, what they're comfortable with, what they, they do. But within the field, I think that we've adopted user without understanding the not only linguistic but social baggage that goes with it. Because once again, you say user and you go, it's just a word. You know, as a cognitive guy, words have a huge connection to how we think and frame conversations. So I use the word member almost partially because it's unusual, because it sort of forces you to stop and think about it. Um, but I really, a user, I have a hard time with. And I, once again, I was a user guy. I was, you know, I, I went through it. User-based, user systems, it's all about the user. But even think about the origin of users and information systems, so excuse me as we go back, way far back, right? But I'm in Rutgers, so I can talk about TEPCO, right? <laughs> Why did we start talking about users? Because TEPCO said, we need to start thinking not just about the system perspective, but the user perspective, and that became language within the ACES community, within the information science community, we began to adopt to mean not just what a computer can do, but what a person can do. Then Taylor picked that up with value-added systems, and he talked about methods of value-added systems. That became, at least on the East Coast, a widely adopted system. But once again, even that original divination of user in our own field came from a response to a system. It was a way of saying, focus not on the system, but on the user of a system, not of a person. It's only now that we're starting to talk about, what is it, HCI has been renamed recently, I understand, instead of human-computer interaction, it's now human-centered computing. Right? It's that back to the idea of 
human person being. I mean, we may not like it, but at least it's, it's this understanding that it's more involved than a transaction. Reference is the same thing. We know, I get a lot of questions still to this day, I'm sure you do. What's the future of reference? The answer is instruction. The answer is to see whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, two-minute consultation, or sitting in front of a class, or YouTube on data science, or just wandering around. We understand that what we're doing is not, here's the material, walk away. I need to know about you, I need to know what you need to know, I need to understand this so that I can, in essence, shape a bit of instruction to you in a very concentrated way. So I disagree. Fair enough. I think the future of reference in a word is collaboration, not instruction. Toward what end? No, I like that. You're right. This is good. I learned. Because instruction Look. implies that... You're absolutely right. The whole... I'm. You it's know, right. Where I'm entering into you, I'm going to instruct you. Whereas, rather than we're going to collaborate together and also open it up more. Anyway, that's another. No, but it's good. No, I love it because it's it's knowledge is constructed, is conversation, is interaction. So you're absolutely right. Once again, use of terms matter, and so I'm learning. Um, but I think that we often use terms. I mean, how many times we talk about users? We talk about data. We talk about processes. We talk about transactions. No, you're right. you know, right. Do we talk about colli you know, collaboration, collegiality, interaction? And we then structure our whole systems, and this goes back to Dewey. So my public librarian friend, how many times do we have to report numbers that we don't care about? How many people through the door? What's my gate count? What, uh, my favorite has always been circulation. <laughs> our circulation's down. Hold on a sec. I'm going to go check out 100 books. We'll be fine. <laughs> okay? What we really want to know is how many lives have we transformed? I'm sorry. I was yes. going to say, I find this a little unrealistic in many most of us got into the profession. I've been a librarian a long time, and that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. Because it's how many one-shot instructions mm -hmm. you can teach, how many. So somebody in a chat room the other night said, you made my day. You know, you helped me, and you made my day. And I thought, well, that's really much more meaningful to me, and I don't care if I did nothing else right. during the day. But that's not reportable in terms of our performance or whether we're Know, but those are the kind of things that drive you on. And so I said to them, well, you made my day too, so I mean, yeah. because really that's the, the way it goes. But that's not the gold standard of the actual workplace and what we do. It is how much did you do, how many reference transactions. Even if you just said one word to a bunch of people with a nasty voice, that's a hundred you know, things versus, versus some making someone's day. Yep. So it's a little bit, I think we get into it for that with the reality of the world. I'm the co-author of a book on digital reference statistics and measures with Chuck McClure. It's very thick, it has lots of measures, and I would say that most of them don't matter. You're absolutely right. And so the question becomes, back to this idea of transactions and information. In data-centric <coughs> world, what I can quantify and what I, is almost more important than why I quantify it. We don't want to get there, that's an extreme statement. But I, I make it so that we can constantly reflect. What we need to do in order to move it from idealism to reality, to make Dee's life real, right? Because it's lovely to say that, and I'm sure we all agree. As you said, we all got into this. But you're going to have to go to a provost. You're going to have to go to a budget meeting. You're going to have to go and report. You Again, what measures have we developed that are better? And the answer isn't, well, we haven't developed any. That, that might, now's a good time. And what we know I grew up just at the edge in information science when we just allowed quant qualitative methods in information <laughs> science research. The guy right before me, Bill Mimone, brilliant, had a chapter three that was 100 pages. And it was 100 pages that more or less could have boiled, been boiled down to, it's OK. I can talk to them. right? And, and you can trust me. And so every doctoral student afterwards literally just took his chapter three and plugged it in. This idea of qualitative methodology. Data science, there is great use for data. The problem is when we pick surrogates that don't make sense and how we build them into algorithms, right? Being able to talk about, for example, have we talked about reach? In public libraries, how many card holders are there? That's at least an attempt to talk about reach. Some level of perception. The idea of engagement. In engagement, you sit there and go, well, I can't count it every one. You don't count every one. You sample. We do this all the time. You sample, you do in-depth, you do qualitative, you do focus groups, you bring in. There are other ways of doing it. 
And what we, what we realize is that we live in this cybernetic system, now I'm really going back, where there's feedback. And what we, what we realize is whenever you say, but we need to provide this because that's what they want, whether it's my boss, whether it's a board, whether it's whatever, realize that the reason they want it is because at some point they were trained to want it. They were taught that that's what it was. And so what happens is we need to go back into that cycle and, can, and revive it. Because I've been on boards of a public library. You know what happens every summer? Our circulation stats are down. Clearly, there's a problem. We must mark it. Be like, wait two months. They'll come right back. Because it's cyclical. And we didn't train them, right? So a better way of presenting that statistics is the rolling statistics and, and magnitude estimations, et cetera. So I hear you. And you asked the right question, which is, OK, how do we begin to measure impact and not transaction? How do we begin to measure relationship and not transaction? And the, I wish I had the right answer. We're working on it. You're working on it. We're all working on it. My, my school library folks are working on it. Uh, and we need to continue to do it. And it's the same thing that when we train our communities, be they professors, be they housewives, be they doctors, be they plumbers, whatever when we work with them, we always complain, well, they look at us as, as the book people. That's because there's a conversation going on somewhere that conversation's not moving ahead. Same thing about how, you know, so what I run into is, like, we're going to build a makerspace. Yeah, we're going to build a makerspace. It's great to build a makerspace. And the community goes, why? That's not a library. And if the answer is because other libraries have done makerspaces, that's not a library. If it's, you know, we're about learning, and people learn by doing and hands-on, and not just what they read out of books, but we do that too. That becomes a conversation. Okay. But I think it's interesting how, well, I'm in a management class, and there are people from different concentrations, and um, we talked about libraries in our last class, and you know, a lot of the people in the class were you know, data science or mm -hmm. IT, and they just really don't seem aware that libraries are innovative in any way. Mm -hmm. When you know, that's all remember. The fact is that you know some a lot of new technology pops up there first. Yeah. Let, let's remember that the World Wide Web was literally invented to solve a citation scholarly citation problem at CERN Lab in the library where Tim Berners Lee was working. No, you're right. And but here's the thing. Have we given them a new narrative? Uh, John Palfrey, love John Palfrey, wrote a great book, Bibliotech, go read it. He talks about one of the, he talks about nostalgia. And he says one of the main problems that libraries face is nostalgia. That is that a lot of people formed their idea of a library when they were 10 years old, 30 years ago. And that nostalgia is holding it back because they want what they thought they had. And they don't have something to put in place. He says we need a new nostalgia. Because the problem isn't only that it was a, it was 30 years ago, it's also that it was a 10-year-old 30 years ago, right? I have two boys. When they were 10, they were morons. Actually, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> I mean, but the point is, and he talks about a need for a new nostalgia. So think about a narrative for a moment. What's the new narrative? I, I look to my, my school library colleagues, right? The narrative of it's the place to send the student, it's the maple. I don't even think if anyone knows what the hell a maple is anymore. But it, it, it's the special, right? The art and phys ed and library and whatever. And you want to be the partner and the research partner, et cetera. How do we build that new narrative? How do we make something that's compelling? Right now, the narrative that has worked, it has worked in many ways, in particular in academic libraries, particularly in special libraries, is the information narrative. We provide you with the connection, the data, the information. We bring the data. We help you compute it. We do it. We do it well. We do it fast. Come get us. Technology is cool. We can get it at your fingertips. It can be mobile. It's awesome. It's a great narrative. It's a, it's a narrative that is driving a lot of economic development in this country, in China, and the world market. But look at the narrative now that Google, Microsoft, Apple are adopting. Because it's no longer the it's cool, it's amazing, it's faster. It's let me show you what has happened in the hospital. Let me show you the social impact that it has. Let me talk about the jobs that we create. In other words, even the high-tech industry has realized that the narrative of newer, faster, better, faster computing needs a human angle to it. And so, I mean, I am a pragmatist to my core. 
Trust me when I tell you that I want a social mission, one as an idealist, but I also want a social mission so that I can say, you know those people who wrote the code for VW to do Dieselgate? If they were my graduate, I would hope they would have an ethical frame that they wouldn't. Right? That gives me a whole different narrative of compiling than I can give you information processing. I can give you people who can process data quickly. I can give you ethical people who understand the human cost and impact of data if not used properly, and the advantage and where we can take your organization for profit, not for profit government, if they can do it properly. That's a different narrative that I can begin to take with that. So you're right, we have a narrative problem, but I think the information narrative within the field is one that's limiting us. We need to push it forward. Right? What's the next thing for LIS? It's not more, right? If you, right, it's the thing that we want to say, but it's like that geeks with social skills that's something, aha, and we were able to step out of the confusion and say, there's a narrative that I understand that others will understand. What's the new narrative for libraries? Is it the data place? Is it the study place? Is it the community learning place? Is it the social responsibility? Is it the living room of the community? In, in, in Europe, they call it the new piazza. To me, the answer is yes, but it's not just because we're happy into it. It's because we're focused on knowledge, impact, and people's understanding of the world, not the tools and things and whatever that lead to that change. Anyway, we have time for one more question. Ross is about to pull out a book. <laughs> yes? It's actually not a question, it's more a statement. And it's because of my background as a specialized librarian in corporations. Yes. A number of years ago, um, Larry Prusak uh, spoke to us. Actually, it was 1995. He had written an article, uh, actually, with, with Tom Dan, who had written a book on knowledge management. Mm -hmm. And in front of all of us, he said, and we were all we were all information professionals um, who were you know working in corporations and the big thing was searching, transactional searching, uh, federated searching, um, and reference and things like that. And one of the things that he said to us that made an impression was, what does um, a chief uh, um, your CEO do when they have to get an answer? He said, do they look on their computer? Well, it was computers were were. were do they look on their computers? Do they look at a book? What do they do? He said they call someone. There has to be a trusted individual that they call. And in order to be able to form that trusted individual, you have to, that, that person has to do the outreach to that CEO or to that anybody. And this is not something that, I went into a big tirade about this some years ago, about how we have lost in corporations the title of chief information officer. Right. That went to somebody else who was doing exactly what you're talking about. We yep. lost it, yep. okay? But that chief information officer does not want to be the person that can answer what that CEO needs. Right. You have to be able to go down and you have to make that, that emotional contact with that person. So it truly is an outgoing kind of a thing, even in a corporation. Yeah. And, and you also see it in public and in academic life. So what you're saying to make a community is very important. Otherwise, we lose our positions. That can be outsourced. And the, and the people who are all around us who are, who are um, in research or in marketing or any number of other areas or departments will take pieces of what we do. They'll take their part of it. Mm -hmm. Not understanding that it's more than that. We are greater than the sum. We are more than the sum of our parts. Right. Absolutely, what she said. <laughs> sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, everyone, and to our online students, I gather there's quite a host of you. We're delighted. Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 to our online students. Uh, I'm Josh Todd. I'm chair of the Department of Library and Information Science. And for well, all of you who are here, um, we've been truly, truly um, uh, we, we first of all want to welcome you and thank you for a day for being here. We have many friends at Rutgers and we are grateful for the, the wonderful input that you have given to us tonight. Um, I always have the job of rounding off and bringing to a close 
these colloquiums and I, and I uh, dearly love that responsibility. There was one moment in your uh, wonderful uh, conversation with us, Dave, that resonated with me. I thought you were ch channeling my dearly departed mother um, <laughs> where you said my twin brother and I would come home from school, we would talk endlessly while there were, were important works to be done on the farm. And my mother would often say, shut up and do something. <laughs> <laughs> from your, your talk. But I do want to say, and I, I probably will sound horrible uh, by, by actually coming back to one of the millions of meanings of information. I too come from a cognitive tradition. And information to me goes right back to the Latin and Greek origins of the word, which is informer, inward forming. This comes right back to the moulding of the mind. And at, at the heart of what you uh, shared with us tonight was the whole arena of understanding and making meaning in the creation and generation of knowledge. And that comes back to the moulding of the mind, the inward formation. And the question you asked, what do we think about, is such a wonderful question. And to me, the challenge that you posed to us was in thinking about this inward forming. What do we, as library and information professionals and educators, think about? It comes right back to the social mission that you spoke about, the sense of community, leading that social mission to see a better tomorrow. And I think they're really, really wonderful words uh, that each of us can take away. Moving from the kind of transactional, uh, the transfer of the bricks of information, coming right back to from transaction to proaction, to thinking about our relationships with those around us, thinking about our impact and the very essence of what you said, which I think is really, really wonderful. Think to create the world our communities deserve. And that's a, a really powerful statement and I want to leave that with you, to create the world our communities deserve. That's a social action, that's a social good outcome, thinking about our social good uh, is such a powerful uh, way to finish this evening. So what I'm going to do is say to us all, and to quote our wonderful speaker tonight, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.